Talk Talk with Dr. Helene. Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. So I'm making this video as an introduction to a new series on my YouTube channel called Doc Talk. And basically that stands for doctor and then talk because I'm talking to physicians, residents and medical students about their journeys into medicine and about the chosen specialty that they are currently practicing. So basically this is a series that will involve me interviewing these different people. I'll basically be asking things like, why did they choose that field? How did they match into that field? What their experience has been like? What their day to day looks like? Just so that you guys can see the full scope of from med student to resident to attending, really kind of catch them at different areas of their medical journey. I'm really excited about it. I think it'll be really cool. So I hope this will be a help to all of you. I hope this will answer a lot of your questions. And yeah, so without further ado, we have my first guest on this channel. Because this person is in a different state, we were not able to have the interview in person, obviously, so this one will be over the Zoom platform. So that's why the quality will be a little different than how my camera is now. All right, let's get started. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let him introduce himself. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Joshua Spear. I'm a third year resident in uh, neurosurgery at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, as far as medical schools go, I went to Morrow School of Medicine and my undergraduate institution was Georgia State University. Awesome, thank you so much for that introduction. So why did you decide to go into medicine? Oh man, so at first, uh, my um, initial thought was I was gonna play sports, like any you know young African-American male growing up. Uh, so I thought I was gonna play basketball. I went to Georgia State University and I met with my academic advisor and uh, she gave me a book to read. She gave me Gifted Hands by Dr. Carson and she said, you know, read this and let me know what you think. I read it and I was inspired. I thought, you know, if he could do this and come from where he came from, then I could do something similar. So essentially, I just buckled down and put in the work. Wow, wow, that's, a, that's like, that's the first time I've heard a story like that. That's awesome. And look at you now, <laughs> a, whole, a whole neurosurgery resident. Yeah. Okay, so speaking of neurosurgery, why did you decide to pursue this uh, specialty? Well, so it's it's challenging, but rewarding. Um, I think it's, it's very high stakes, it's very stressful, but then at the end of the day, when you have a great outcome, your patients are very thankful. Um, sometimes you do have bad outcomes, that, that, that does happen. But I mean, like, you learn how to deal with it and it goes along with the job. Was there anything that specifically sparked um, neurosurgery? So did you think about general surgery at all? Did you think about other, you know, cardiovascular surgery? Like, how did neurosurgery become the forefront? I thought about general surgery until I did my third year general surgery rotation. And um, yeah, I, I, I wasn't a fan of colons, colorectal, anything. So that X that out. Cardiovascular surgery, maybe, but no. Oh, hell no! No, I'm not putting patients on bypass, restarting hearts. No, I just want to go in, fix the problem, close them up, call it a day. So neurosurgery did that for you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Cool. fair. Okay, what did you think um, set you apart in your application to residency so that you were sure that you would match into neurosurgery? Oh man, so that's a very good question. First things first, um, step one score. I think that was, that's the biggest thing. So a lot of programs have screening criteria, so to speak. They have a cutoff for step one score, they have a cutoff for GPA, um, and then based off that, if you meet those cutoffs, then they look at the rest of your you know, application. So step one score kind of got me in the door and then the rest of it was my story. Um, and then in addition to that, um, I did a couple of rotations in neurosurgery at different institutions. So I think like the biggest thing was my story, but then also my step one score. I think being an African-American male, coming from a low income household and you know, pretty large family and Doing what I did on step one, and I think that kind of like everyone was like, "Oh, you know, interesting. I want to, you know, meet this guy." Right, right. 
Are you willing to share your step one score so that people can kind of get an idea of what they should aim? Oh, so uh, step one, I got a 255. Uh, step two, I got a 254. Um, some people say 240, 245 is the cutoff. I think that's a reasonable estimate. If you can get greater than that, more power to you. Um, that just makes you look a lot better. Okay. Um, and someone specifically asked um, if they happen to have already taken step one and they got in the high 220s or the low 230s, what advice would you give to them if they still wanted to match me else with three? Oh, man. So, um, Biggest thing um, after step one, I would say letters of recommendation. So who you know, who vouches for you, that really matters, okay? Your story plays an important role. Extracurriculars, not so much. Um, I went on a couple interviews and no one really talked about what I did outside of medicine. <laughs> so there's that. Publications, um, great. If you can get a publication in Nature, uh, JAMA, those are high impact journals. I think that's great. Journal of Neurosurgery, great. Um, but at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to who you know and who writes your letters of recommendation and what they say in the letters. Mm. Um, someone can write you a great letter of recommendation where you think it's great or whatever. They write two sentences, three sentences, but if they write a paragraph or two paragraphs on someone else, then comparatively, it looks like, okay, they just did this to you just to do it as opposed to them actually taking the time and writing a long detailed letter of recommendation. So I think who you know, you know, matters. Um, step one score, if you've already done it, then you can't change that. You just need to look at everything else in your application and see if you can tune things up as, as, as much as possible. Okay, okay, good advice there. Um, and also someone happened to ask um, if their medical school does not have a neurosurgery department, how can they go about finding a mentor? Yeah, oh, man, so <laughs> when, when I went to my school of medicine, we didn't have neurosurgery. I don't know, probably still don't have neurosurgery now, but when I went, we did it, and I didn't know of any other mentoring program uh, out there. So I went through women in neurosurgery. Obviously, I'm not a woman, uh, but I was paired with uh, Dr. Odette Harris. She was a neurosurgeon at uh, Emory University, now she's at Stanford, and she you know, worked with me, mentored me from you know afar. We sent emails back and forth, and she got me in touch with people. So that was my way of reaching out. Now, AANS has a mentoring program that you can actually like apply for, just apply to be a member, and they have a questionnaire of what you need or what you're looking for in a mentor, and what level you are, and then they'll pair you with someone and then just reach out and contact. Nice. I think that'll be the best way from a distance. Now, locally, um, I sent a ton of emails to random neurosurgeons just to see who would bite. And right. the guy said yes, and I went and shadowed him in clinic, and it was a good experience. Okay, good. You kind of already touched on this, but what research did you have? Like, what was your research about? Um, and is it completely necessary to have research in order to match into neurosurgery? So, uh, there's, there's two answers to this question, yes and no. My research uh, publication was on total hip arthroplasty. Okay. So, um, between my first and second year of medical school, I did a summer research fellowship here at Mayo Clinic and I was paired with a cardiac anesthesiologist, but he knew an orthopedic surgeon and they were doing a project on you know patients post total hip arthroplasty. Basically, we paired patients with uh, Fitbit monitors. Okay. Uh, we taught them how to use them. We put it on them, you know, after surgery, and they walk around. And every day we track how mobile each patient was, and then we correlated like 30 day mobility with like overall outcome. Mm -hmm. um, but that was my that was my research premise. There was nothing specifically neurosurgery. So long story short. Not a ton of research, only total hip arthroplasties, which isn't neurosurgical. Right. And I still managed to end up here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good to know. So in residency, what is a typical day-to-day -day for you um, in regards to work, in regards to the things that you do outside of work? Oh, man. So um, lately things are different. 
as it probably yeah. is everywhere. But <laughs> right. Um, you know, before everything kind of changed, wake up at about four o'clock in the morning. You gym for approximately one hour or so. And then at five o'clock, you go clean up, shower. And then by six o'clock, you're at your desk, updating lists. And then between six o'clock and seven o'clock, you're AM rounding on, on patients. And then you're site marking patients going to the OR that day. In addition to that, you're like getting informed consent if you need to, if not, then you go back to your desk, you drop the notes on the patient. So every, every patient gets a progress note and then orders that you think that the patient is gonna need for that day, discharge, um, if they need certain meds, so on and so forth. And then at uh, seven o'clock in the morning, that's when we go to conference. So seven to 8 a.m. is conference. Okay. And then since I'm on spine, uh, from eight to like 8.15, we have spine rounds. And then after that, you go to the OR and you get the cases going. Gotcha, gotcha. Around what time does your day kind of end? It probably varies, but. <laughs> it varies, it varies. So, so spine, um, I guess once you've learned and done a ton of spine, you kind of get used to the like workflow and you can yeah. move faster, you can kind of move to you know own pace. So sometimes, you know, I can get three cases done, four cases done and be out of the hospital by like four o'clock in the afternoon. Other times, if it's a more extensive, you know, case like a spine fusion, like a like a T2 to like pelvis fusion, um, that'll take you to like six o'clock at night. So you'll be in one case from 8.30 to six o'clock at night. Yeah. If it's a cranial case and a very large tumor, something that's in like eloquent, you know, hemispheres or like where languages are showing and so forth, you have to monitor, then they can take you till like 10, 11 o'clock at night. It just, just depends on what the case is. Yeah. So have you had any experiences in residency that you weren't expecting? Um, anything that's been like super difficult in residency? So the, the most difficult part I would say is time management. There's a transition between medical school and residency. And, and in medical school, I kind of felt like I was on my own time until you get to like third year, fourth year, but essentially it's like, okay, they don't really need me. I can come in here, see my one patient, my two patients, but then the patients then kind of like disappear. But in residency, you can't really do that. Yeah. It's more so about, you know, this is your patient, you have to manage this patient. If something goes wrong, um, then you have to figure out, okay, how do I fix this? And, you know, a lot of times it's you making the like decision of care for a patient. Yeah. But once you get that down, I think uh, it's 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 not that difficult. Coming from someone that's gotten a 250 plus on step one. Um, but what has been the most, the best part of residency so far? Oh man, the, the best part of residency, it's when, when you've made a difference you know, in a in a patient's life, and they express their gratitude. So sometimes I I get gifts from you know patients. Don't want to send you like a gift basket, or you'll get a card. Like you know, you really made a difference in my life. I'll never forget. You know, here, um, you know, we don't see that many minority patients, and you know, I had I had an African American you know lady. She was kind of out of it, you know, it was immediately post-op. She was still like under anesthesia and pain meds and so on and so forth. But her husband was there. He looked at me, we made eye contact and nothing needed to be said. Like, mm. he was like, he was like, baby, yeah. look, like, you know, he tried to wake his wife up and was like, look, you know, look who we have. And then he shook my hand. Yeah. And that was, that was all I needed for the day. Uh, yeah. It's a great story. Once you become an attending um, and you have your own practice, what are your goals um, that you want to achieve? Oh man, so uh, there's, uh, there's a long list, there's a long list. So I kind of don't really like the politics of academic medicine. You kind of always have someone looking over your shoulder and I just kind of feel like you're like always on on your knees in a, in a sense, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And I don't really, I don't, I don't really like that part of academic medicine, but I do like men mentoring. I do like teaching when I can. Okay. So I was thinking maybe either a providemic practice where it's partially academic tacked on to a medical center. Okay. I still get residents. I still get, you know, you know, medical students. But then I'd also have the, the private practice side, which would just be me 
my PA, you know, my team, and I see patients in clinic and so on and so forth. Yeah. I think, you know, that would be my most ideal practice. Uh, I, I actually decided to, to get my MBA, um, and I think that'll be helpful as far as me learn, learning the business side of, of, of medicine. Right. Do you have any plans on doing a fellowship? So neurosurgery is pretty long. It's, it's seven years long. We have two years of research built in. And during, during those research years, you can actually choose what you want to do. So one of those is going to be me finishing my MBA. And then the second is the Info to Spine Fellowship. Gotcha. So my focus is going to be spine, but I'm going to do, do my uh, Info to Spine Fellowship as a resident in my residency. So when I graduate, I don't have to do a formal one. That's really smart. It's like you're basically just utilizing the time that you already have without adding on to it. Basically. Okay. So who are you outside of the white coat? What do you like to do for fun? <laughs> Lift weights. Um, I used to draw a lot. I used to write poetry. Um, so it's mostly lifting weights and movies when I can and sleep and more yeah. sleep and sleep a little more. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, just to kind of wrap things up, what is just some general advice that you would give to um, any pre-med student, any med student, um, just general advice about this journey through medicine? Oh, man. So um, it's a marathon, not a sprint, which is true. It's very true. Yeah. That's, that's first and foremost. And then number two, um, anything worth having in life, you have to work hard for. Like no one's gonna give it to you. You know, you have to get out there and take it. And I think this is one of those one of those things. You know, when you wake up in the morning, sometimes you know you're gonna be tired. You're gonna not want to go to work. You yeah. may cry. Yeah. <laughs> you may cry a couple times. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you know, things get better. You know, over time, and then sooner. You know, than you think you'll be at the end of the tunnel, walking out of the door, and like, okay, like. I learned so much on this journey. Uh, I wouldn't trade for the world. So. Gotcha. That's it for this interview, guys. Thanks so much for watching this video. Um, if you have any questions, any specific questions about neurosurgery, about the match process, about anything that was left out in this video, um, you can contact Josh. All of his information will be in the description box below. But thanks again, Josh, for agreeing to do this and just taking the time out to be in this video and just kind of help inspire and. Um, just provide information for people that are interested. So I really appreciate that. Other than that, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you in my next video. You gotta do the, you gotta do the, come on. Oh my, okay. <laughs> <laughs>